when I was in my early 20s, I moved out of my parents' house with my brother. With a mutual friend, we rented our own two-story house. It was an older style home, with very high ceilings and ornate decorative handrails and doorknobs. It wasn't until after we moved in that we learned that at one point the house was used as a funeral home, and out in the detached garage was where bodies used to be stored and prepared for display. I guess it made sense, since there was a small cemetery just behind the house, though most of the tombs were obscured by the tall grass. We were all big into those paranormal type ghost hunting shows, so on one of the first nights we were living there, we went outside and tried to capture EVP on our phones. We would ask questions and play back the recordings to see if we had caught anything. We were disappointed, but not surprised, when after about a half hour or so, we gave up, not uncovering anything even remotely creepy. But looking back, however, I think we succeeded in getting something's attention. It started slow. Our friend had chronic back problems, so instead of sleeping upstairs, he would sleep on the couch downstairs. Every so often he would tell us that he heard footsteps or muttering voices coming from the far side of the house. Specifically the voice of a woman, talking in a kind of happy sing-song voice, like she was talking playfully with a small child. After a while, all three of us would begin to feel very uncomfortable downstairs at night. We felt as though something was peering in at us from the darkness outside. We covered all the windows with sheets, and our friend wasn't too happy about sleeping on the ground floor on his own. But me and my brother were not willing to sleep downstairs, and he didn't want to have to suffer climbing the stairs twice a day. One night, we awoke to screaming coming from downstairs. We ran down to the living room to discover our friend, staring wide-eyed up at the ceiling, clutching his blanket like he was trying to tear it in two. He said that he had awoken to the sound of ragged, labored breathing coming from the corner of the room, and when he called out, something shifted in the darkness. We helped him climb up the stairs, and he spent the night on the second floor with us. I personally believe that I had the two most vivid, alarming experiences, even though I didn't tell my roommates about them at the time. There was this one time I was home alone, and I was cleaning up my bedroom, and singing along to my tunes. It was broad daylight, and I didn't feel uneasy or nervous at all. Everything seemed normal. I turned around to grab something and exit my room. When I froze, something had just exited my room. I caught the glimpse of a tall figure with long dark hair walking out of the door and turning sideways to walk down the hall. Most of the memory is a blur, but one thing I do distinctly remember was seeing feathers hanging from the back of the figure's head, among its hair. I shot out of my room and tore after the figure. I ran downstairs, but there was no one there. I was completely alone in the house. My second experience happened the day that we finally moved out. We had been living in the house for well over a year at this point. My brother and friend had since moved everything out and I was alone sweeping in the kitchen area. From across the house, I heard a soft thud, like a pile of towels had fallen over onto the floor. It made me pause, because I knew that there was practically nothing left in the house that could have been tipped over. I'm not sure why I decided to do it, but I began to speak aloud in the empty house around me. We're leaving the house now, so we won't be bothering you anymore. If you have anything to say to me, now's the time. I waited a few seconds, but I got no response, so I tried again. If you can hear me, show me a sign. I knocked hard on the counter three times, and almost immediately, from somewhere down in the basement, I heard three knocks mimicking my own in the same rhythm. I dropped the broom and power walked right out of the front door and waited on the front steps until my brother got back to pick me up. I told him that the cleaning was done 
and there was no reason to step foot in the house again. The one thing that I take away from this is that I'm never even going to pretend to mess with the supernatural ever again. I started a tech job with an IP DT1 long distance company. The company is no longer around and honestly, I don't know how they stayed in business as long as they did. It was really a pyramid scam, but thankfully I was on the IT side of things so I didn't have to sell anything. It was a small typical tech support call center. The customers would call in or Verizon, Quest, etc. would call in and say, DT1 lines were down or outages. I was the only female on my team, having to prove myself and show that I can do anything my male counterparts could. It didn't take long and the customers respected me for being able to handle things. After making my mark, I decided to take the 10 hour night shifts. I worked Wednesday through Saturday from 1pm to 12am, an hour lunch, and after 6pm, I was completely alone in the whole building. The rush to get out of the office by 6 p.m. was insane. I couldn't blame them, but I decided having three days off was better than two. Like I said, I was by myself for most of the night. I would have to keep an eye on emails and make sure I answered calls. It was a very slow shift. I would get a lot of video game, reading, schoolwork, and writing done during this time. But sometimes, I would just wander the building, walk around just to get away from my desk for a time. I would have the VoIP phone system connected to my cell phone so no calls would be missed. This allowed me to go get a soda, go get food, and so on. One time while I was up away from my desk, I was going down to the lunchroom to grab a soda. The vending machine was on the basement floor. The basement had a wall of windows and one set of security doors. Same for the main entrance, only there was one camera facing that door. But nothing else to really make you feel very safe. I didn't like going to the basement much because the back of the building faced an acre of dark woods. There was a walking path to the woods, but for some reason they didn't install lights for the walking path. Never really sure why that was but it didn't help the creepy factor. Sometimes I would see animals run past, but other times I felt like someone was watching me. I always tried my best to make it fast when getting a soda or snack, but sometimes it didn't feel fast enough. So, one night I was making my way down to the basement of the building to get a soda. It was a slow dragging night and I needed a little caffeine for a pick-me-up. I counted my money as I walked to make sure I had enough to get in and out quick. But out of the corner of my eye I saw something dart from the glass door back into the darkness. I stopped dead in my tracks and tried to scan the forest but like I said, it was just blackness. I felt a bit of unease and everything told me to turn my heels and go back to my desk. But it was 9pm and I had a fair bit of time left on my shift before I could blow this popsicle stand. I tried shaking the feelings off and briskly walked over to the soda machine and made my selection. The soda dropped and as I bent down to get it, I heard a loud ping noise. It was as if someone had hit the glass with something. I stood straight up and felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I slowly turned around and was scared to see someone out there. But as I made the full turn, I saw once again nothing but darkness. I thought this was a good time to book it back up to the main floor. I didn't bother with the elevator, I went to the stairs and ran up them. My heart was already racing from having to go down there in the first place, then the loud bang, and now running up two flights of stairs. 
Once I was back at my desk, I sunk down in my chair and tried to calm down. It was just one noise. I was in a building with locked doors and locked inner offices. I kept saying over and over again in my head that it was nothing. I was relieved by that, but out of nowhere I got that feeling of someone watching me again. I peeked up over my cubicle wall and looked around my office. Nothing seemed out of place until I turned to face the front of the building. Outside the first set of doors was a slender, tall, dirty man. He was cupping his hands around his eyes to try and see past the reflecting of the lights inside. I dropped back down into my cubicle before he could catch sight of me. He didn't look like anyone I have ever seen at the office and it was a little past 9pm and there was no good reason why he is checking out my office. As I sit in my chair, I hear the door shake. I slowly stood up and watched him pull at the handles of the doors. They didn't budge to my relief. But as I watched him, he turned to face me. His face looked bruised or dirty, I couldn't tell which. Once his eyes locked onto mine, he started to bang harder and smack the glass. I was so scared, it was the middle of the night. I was by myself and out in the middle of this office building complex. I grabbed my headset and dialed 911. While getting the operator on the line, the guy was walking back and forth from one side of the glass doors to the next. 911, what's your emergency? The lady's voice was direct. Yes, my name is Samantha and I work at Spectrum IT Services building. I need someone to come out. There's a guy trying to break into my office building. While speaking with her, the guy disappeared from view. I tried to look in all directions, but I didn't see him. I knew that he wouldn't just walk off, not with how hard he was banging. Out of nowhere, a good-sized rock came out of nowhere and smashed against the door. I screamed and went under my desk. The operator asked what just happened and I explained that a rock smashed against the glass door. She asked me if the glass was broken enough to let him in. I didn't want to stand up and look, but she told me to look in order to know where he was now. I crawled out from under my desk and just peeked over my wall and saw a huge crack down the first part of the door. I sank back down and told her to please have the police hurry. She said they were on their way. I have read many stories like this before, and people say that the cops couldn't get there fast enough, and they aren't kidding. It feels like time is standing still, and you can do nothing. Another smash against the door but along with that, the sound of glass breaking. Sirens could be heard coming towards my building. It was music to my ears. I told the operator that the police had arrived and thanked her for all her support. I stood back up and looked over the cubicle wall and the red-blue lights were flashing wildly. But the thing I didn't see was the man. The top part of the door was completely smashed and the rock was laying on the inside of the entryway. One officer came to the front door and others were out combing the area. I could see their flashlights moving all around the parking lot. The first officer to come in the building and greet me was a very kind man. He was patient with me and let me explain what I saw happen. Soon, my boss arrived and checked on me and then the damage. At some point my husband was called and I told him I would be escorted home by one of the officers. I took the next few days off and started to look for another job that wasn't by myself at night. When I gave my statement, I explained to the officer that the person could be partnered with an ex-co-worker who was fired a few weeks prior for stealing and just not showing up. He knew when people came and went, he knew where we kept the cell phones we were selling not under lock and key, but under a desk of the provisioner. From smartphones to blackberries, when they were still worth buying, plus VoIP boxes and phone cards. I went on to leave this job a month later and started at a credit card machine company. It was an office full of people, still a call center, 
but I felt safer, especially with the security and cameras all over the building. Like I said before, this company is no longer around. It was bought up by another company, and they basically liquidated all of the funds that were worth something. So dirty man who tried to break into my office, let's never meet again. I had three really good friends, and their name were Kevin, Ryan, and Tommy. Every summer our parents would take us on a vacation. We always stayed in a remote cabin in the forest of Minnesota. The cabin was located on a large island in the middle of Lake Vermilion. Eventually, when we were old enough, our parents let us go to the cabin on our own for the first time. When we got there, we parked the car on the gravel road beside the lake. Then we had to take a boat across the lake, about half a mile to reach the cabin. There were a few other cabins on the island, but they were all at least half a mile away. The cabin was quite small and only had a kitchen, a bathroom, and two bedrooms. At night, it was pitch black. There were no street lights for miles and the only light came from the moon. There were no curtains on the windows, so when you were sleeping at night, you could see the moon shining down on the trees and the lake outside. On the third night of our trip, we set up a campfire by the edge of the lake. The moon was full and the pale white glow was shimmering across the lake. We were gazing up at the stars when all of a sudden we heard a splashing sound, as if something was moving about in the water. Ryan suddenly stood up and pointed, saying, What the hell is that? We all looked in the direction he was pointing, peering into the darkness. After a while, I could make out he was pointing at. I'll never forget the feeling of terror that came over me. The hair on the back of my neck stood up and goosebumps appeared on my arms. I was paralyzed in fear. Out in the middle of the lake, there was a woman's head. It was just floating there on the surface of the water, staring directly at us. She had pale white skin and long black hair. Her hair was matted to her face. The rest of her was submerged or not even there. We tried to tell ourselves that it was just a loon. They are black and white birds that hunt at night, diving deep into the water. It didn't look like a loon, but that's what we tried to convince ourselves it was. We threw some more wood on the fire and tried to forget about it, but it still gave me the creeps. About an hour later, I had to go to the toilet, so I walked down to the edge of the dock and peed into the lake. Looking out over the moonlit lake, I noticed the thing was still there. But now it was much closer. It still looked like the woman's head and it still seemed to be staring right at me. Its face was still extremely pale, as if it hadn't been out in the sun for years and I could easily make out some facial features. The eyes and the nose. A feeling of incredible unease came over me as I realized it couldn't be a loon. There was no way a loon could just tread water for that long. There were no ripples around it either. It wasn't moving at all. It was just standing there, stiff as a board, submerged in the water. I immediately zipped up my pants and ran back up to the dock to where my friends were, sitting around the campfire. I told them what I'd seen, but none of them dared to go down to the dock to take a closer look. We tried to tell ourselves it was just a log or a tree branch, just floating out in the water. I could tell everyone else felt uneasy too. None of us really believed that. We went back into the cabin and we shut the door, locking it behind us. It was very late and we just needed sleep. None of us mentioned a thing in the lake. We were all trying to avoid talking about it, honestly. There were no curtains on the windows and I was getting ready for bed. I couldn't help but taking one last look. Peering out of the window, I could see the lake clearly, illuminated by the full moon. But the thing wasn't there anymore. It had completely vanished. I let out a sigh of relief, thinking it was a log that just floated away, or else it sank below the surface. 
Or perhaps it had been a loon and it finally flown away. It was very hot that night and we had to sleep with the windows open. My friend Tommy and I slept in one bedroom and my two other friends slept in the other. We left our bedroom doors open. I was finding it hard to sleep, very, very hard. It was the middle of the summer and there wasn't even a slight breeze. The heat was stifling. As I lay there, I thought I could hear someone walking around outside the cabin. I kept my eyes tightly shut and tried to tell myself it was just my imagination. It sounded like someone with bare, wet feet pacing back and forth. I was trembling with fear, but I felt so weak I, I couldn't move. The footsteps, they sounded like they were walking up the steps to the cabin door. I wanted to shout out to my friends, but I was frozen in terror. Then the footsteps turned around and sounded like they were running down the steps and toward the lake. After a while, the footsteps faded away and there was only silence. I reached over and shook my friend Tommy. He was already awake and he claimed he had heard the footsteps as well. Just then, I was startled to see Ryan coming running into our room. When he stepped into the moonlight, I could see his face and the expression on it was very, very disturbing. He told us, we need to leave. I asked why, what did you hear? He said, let's just go, he insisted. Let's get to the boat and it's time to go. He wouldn't answer. He just ran back into his room. We followed him and found Kevin sitting on his bed, already packing up his things. Ryan was running around frantically grabbing his stuff and stuffing it into a bag. What's wrong? I demanded. Ryan, what the hell is wrong with you? Tell us. He just stopped in his tracks and stared at me. There was a hunted look in his eyes. I would never forget what he said. He told us he was turning over in his bed to get more comfortable when he suddenly saw at the top right corner of his window, someone was peeking in. As soon as he set his eyes on it, the face vanished. He said all he saw was long black hair hanging down the window ghostly white skin and one large eye staring at him. When he said that it chilled us to the bone, we realized that if the face was in the top right corner of the window, that meant the thing had to be damn near eight feet tall or else floating in midair. I felt like I was going to be sick. Let's just go now. We all agreed and packed our stuff up as quickly as we could. We grabbed our bags and ran out of the cabin, locking the door behind us. As we scrambled down the front steps, I glanced to the side and I saw footprints, bare, wet footprints in the dirt all around the cabin. We ran down to the boat and threw our stuff in. We untied the boat from the dock and we sped off. I looked back over my shoulder and stared at the island but I didn't see anything moving. However, I had the strangest feeling that someone or something was watching us. When we finally reached the other side of the lake, we tied up the boat, stuffed our backpacks in the car and drove off. We had been driving for about 10 minutes when, out of the blue, Ryan suddenly broke down sobbing. He kept saying over and over, what was it guys? What was it? What did we see? On the way, we called our parents to tell them what happened. Ryan was freaking out, and we didn't know what to do. They told us to just get home safely and quickly. My friend's dad went up to the cabin a few days later and said he saw nothing out of the ordinary. However, he did mention that there were bare, wet footprints all around the cabin, which he thought was odd. Whatever Ryan saw in the window really hit him hard. After his breakdown, he had trouble sleeping and ended up having to go into therapy. They gave him some pills to calm him down 
and allowed him to get a decent night's sleep. As time went on, he recovered and ended up being fine. But to this day, he still can't sleep unless the curtains on his window are completely shut. To this day, I still cannot explain what we saw in the lake that night. I never went back to the cabin. Tommy and Kevin had both gone back and everything was fine. But Ryan refuses to go back and frankly, I'm with him on this one. One evening I was looking for an internet cafe because I needed to send a few emails. I spotted one in an old building. The sign said it was on the sixth floor. When I walked through the entrance, there was a dark hallway that led to a small elevator. I pressed the call button and when the doors opened, I stepped inside. In a lot of Asian countries, many buildings do not have a fourth floor. The number four is considered bad luck because the word four sounds almost the same as the word for death. When it stopped and the doors opened, I was about to step out when I realized that something was wrong. The hallway was in total darkness. By the light emanating from the elevator, I could make out a random piece of furniture covered with white cloth. It looked like it hadn't been touched in years. I thought I might have gotten off on the wrong floor, so I checked the button, but none of them were lit up. There was nothing to indicate which floor I was on. Just then, I noticed something moving at the end of the darkened hallway. I couldn't quite make out what it was but it looked like a person dressed in some type of gown. The figure was moving slowly down the hallway towards the elevator. It creeped me out and in a panic, I started pressing the closed door button. All of a sudden, the light in the elevator flickered and turned off. I was plunged into the pitch darkness. I was so freaked out, I almost wet myself. Just as I was about to lose it completely, the lights flickered back on, the doors closed. The elevator jolted back to life and began to ascend again. I breathed a sigh of relief. When the doors opened this time, I was at the internet cafe. I went over to the counter and told the girl who worked there and what had happened. As she listened, her face grew pale. She said that some of the customers and a few of her co-workers had experienced the same thing. She had never experienced anything herself, but she told me about the history of the building. Apparently, the fourth floor had been a hair salon at one time. It was prospering and doing pretty good until one of the women who worked there killed herself in the salon. Nobody knew the reason why. The salon continued to operate, but they were plagued by weird and inexplainable events. Sometimes when customers were having their hair washed, the water would turn as red as blood. Other people claimed that when they looked in the mirror, they would catch glimpses of a ghostly figure standing behind them. When they turned around, there would be no one there. Because of these events, the salon developed a bad reputation and began to lose customers. Eventually, they were forced to close down. The building's owner tried to rent the fourth floor out to other businesses, but when they found out what had happened, nobody would take it. Finally, the owner reduced the price to nearly nothing and it was rented by a businessman who planned to open a stationary supply store. However, when they tried to do some renovations on the floor, there was a series of mysterious accidents. The workmen's tools would sometimes disappear, only to be found in the strange places. A large mirror suddenly shattered when nobody was near it, and the workman had his hand crushed when the elevator closed unexpectedly. Eventually, the workmen were so spooked that they refused to continue. The building's owner gave up trying to rent the fourth floor out and just shut it down. He had the buttons in the elevator replaced and it was reprogrammed that nobody could go on the fourth floor. At least that's what's supposed to happen. For some reason, when people took the elevator, it would sometimes stop on the fourth floor and when the doors opened, some people would see a figure coming toward them in the darkness. I honestly still don't know what that was. When I was growing up, my dad and I lived with my grandparents. My parents had me while they were teenagers, and my dad got full custody because he lived with my grandparents, and my mom was just living with random friends 
going from house to house every few weeks. I was the daughter my grandparents never had, and they doted on me. When I was six, my grandpa passed away from cancer. This story takes place about five months after he passed. This was, I believe, on a Saturday, and my dad was at work. My grandma decided to take me to McDonald's for lunch, and like any six-year-old, I was really excited. So we go down to the McDonald's that was about a mile and a half from our house, order our lunch, and sit down at a table to eat. At the time, we were the only ones eating inside. About ten minutes after we sit down, though, a scraggly-looking man walks in, orders a meal, and sits down at the table diagonally in front of us to the left. The area we lived in was middle and upper class, so this guy looked pretty out of place. Graham had her back to him, but I could see him perfectly. This man was in at least his mid-fifties, with really wiry, scraggy, and dirty white hair and a beard. He had on blue shorts and a white t-shirt, also kind of dirty, and sandals. It's amazing. This happened 21 years ago, but I can remember it like it was yesterday. So I noticed that under the table, this man had something dark, pink, and wrinkly in his lap, and he kept glancing at me and rubbing it every few seconds. In kindergarten, we learned about stranger danger and good touch, bad touch, and learned which parts of our body people weren't supposed to touch. It clicked in my six-year-old head that this man was not supposed to have that out like that, nor be doing what he was doing. I got really queasy and nervous. I didn't want to tell my gram right then and there, because I thought the man might hurt us. If my dad had been there, though, I would have said something, because my dad was my hero and could take on anybody. Instead, I put my Happy Meal box in front of my face, so my view of this guy could be blocked. I had about half of my food left, but at this point I'd lost my appetite. Graham asked me if I was full and I just nodded yes. I was, and still am, very petite, so not finishing a full meal was nothing new for me. She asked me if I wanted to go play in the play area before we left, but I just shook my head and quietly said, I want to go home. Graham cleared our table and we left. When we got home, I was still really nervous, and I felt like I was going to throw up. Graham asked me, What's the matter, Munchkin? Her pet name for me. And I started crying and told her about the man at the McDonald's and what I saw. My Graham didn't panic or freak or get hysterical. She just hugged me and said, It's alright. Go on to your room and play. I'll take care of it. She wiped my tears gave me a blueberry Kool-Aid burst, and told our dog, Patches, to go to my room with me, which she did. After I was out of earshot, Graham called the McDonald's and told them about this guy. Turns out, he was still there. The manager told Graham he'd take care of it and call her back. An hour later, the manager calls back and tells Graham they called the police, who showed up in record time and arrested the guy. When the police told the man to stand up, his franken-beans were still hanging out of his shorts. The manager also told Graham that she could bring me back for a month's worth of coupons for free Happy Meals. I have another story about a weirdo that happened a few years later, and this time my dad was there. And believe me, what my dad did to him was not pretty. But that's a story for another time. So this happened over the course of a year. In the fall of 2005, I moved into Goldstein Hall for my freshman year of college. Goldstein Hall was your typical three-story dormitory, built in the 60s and had seen better days. My room was your typical cinder block dorm. It wasn't very fancy, but it was home for the year. I quickly threw myself into the college lifestyle. Classes, sports, parties, and living on pizza. Things were normal at first. My roommate Alex was a very shy kid who liked computers and watching football games. But he was homesick and he spent a lot of time at home. So I would get the room to myself. One day while typing up a paper on my computer, 
I felt a chill go up my back as my TV suddenly turned on. I was creeped out, but I tried telling myself that I must have accidentally hit the remote button even though I knew it was on my bed. There were times I would hear knocks at my window, but nobody would be there. Or I would have my door open and see it slam shut, as though it had been hit with a gust of wind. One day I came home to find my radio was on, even though I knew I had turned it off when I left for classes that day. I would see books being out of place, and there was this one time that my Phillies baseball cap, that I couldn't find for a week, suddenly appeared on top of my computer. Every once in a while, I would smell the strong smell of cologne in my room, despite the fact that I don't wear cologne, and Alex was almost never in the room. Each time, something weird happened. I always tried to explain it away to myself, with less and less success. The weirdest incident of that semester happened when Alex and I were sitting in the dorm, watching Thursday Night Football. When out of nowhere, our microwave came on for about five seconds and then stopped. Alex and I looked at each other for a moment, not saying a word. Then we went back to just watching the game. He wound up skipping his Friday morning classes and immediately went home the next day. The end of the semester came and Alex decided that he was going to transfer out of the school. I wasn't too surprised because I knew that he wasn't really into going here. After finals, I decided to be nice and help Alex load up his car. My family wasn't going to pick me up for winter break until the next day, so I had no problem with helping the guy move out. We had just finished packing up Alex's car in the parking lot, and we started to say our goodbyes, when Alex suddenly looked at me with a serious expression on his face. He then said, I don't know how you can stand being in that room. You know what I'm talking about. I then let out a deep breath. <sighs> yeah, I know. I'll be fine. We then shook hands, and I watched Alex leave Goldstein Hall for the last time. Luckily, nothing weird happened that night, and over winter break, I managed to convince myself that I was just having an overactive imagination. The new semester started in mid-January of 2006, and I was excited for my new roommate, this time it was a guy named Matthew, who was redshirting for the football team. Matthew was pretty nice, although I didn't have a lot in common with him. Matthew stayed for about the first week of classes, and then immediately switched to another dorm. He didn't even say a word to me about it. I came home from classes one day, and all of his stuff was gone. When Matthew left, all the strange stuff that had been going on in the previous semester started up again. I was willing to deal with the weirdness of the room, because I liked having a double room to myself, for the price of a single room. As a means to cope, I started drinking more. Hey, I was 19 at the time. I learned to ignore it when a weird chill went around the room, or when my favorite sweater would be on my bed instead of in my closet where I had left it, or when I would fall asleep in my bunk bed and hear rustling on the bunk above me, even though it should have been empty. Denial is a beautiful thing. The year eventually started to wind down, and in early April, I wound up getting really drunk at a lacrosse party, and we're talking really drunk, like just short of being hospital drunk. My friends Mason and Ryan walked me home that night, and I remember them helping me get into my bed and placing a trash can right next to it just in case I got sick. I then fell into a deep, drunken sleep. Suddenly, I felt water splash across my face. A guy that I didn't recognize stood over me, holding a water bottle. From what I could make out in the dark, he was a short, stocky guy with blonde hair and brown eyes. He yelled at me that there was a fire and that I needed to get out of the building. Confused as to how he got into my room and still being pretty drunk, I somehow managed to grab my phone and stumble out of the building with the fire alarm blaring and the sprinklers going off. The guy was right behind me until I lost him in the crowd of residents and RAs who were standing in the parking lot in front of the building, waiting for the fire trucks to arrive. It turned out that some genius in his drunken state tried to set off firecrackers in the common area on the second floor 
which started the fire. We were allowed to move back in two weeks later, after all the water damage was repaired. When I got back, nothing happened in that dorm for the last two weeks. I tried looking for the guy that had woken me up in the dorm, but I couldn't find him anywhere. And eventually the year was over, and I left that dorm for good. Fast forward to about Halloween weekend, 2006. I moved back home and switched to commuting to school because frankly, I had had enough of the dorm life experience. I made friends with a kid in my drama class named John. John was your typical theater nerd and we got along pretty well. That Saturday afternoon, we were working together in the library for a test. Given that it was Halloween weekend, John and I started talking about our weird experiences. That's when I mentioned that I had been subjected to weird occurrences at Goldstein Hall. John looked at me dead in the eye and said, You know that's where a kid died back in the 80s, right? My uncle who went here at the time told me about it. John went on to tell me that in April of 1986, a group of guys who were in a frat decided to set off a smoke bomb inside the common area on the second floor of Goldstein Hall. It started a fire that quickly got out of control, and a student died. He was found in his dorm on the first floor, apparently dying of smoke inhalation while trying to escape. Naturally, the story spooked me, and feeling immensely curious, I asked John if he wanted to look up the yearbook archives that were in the library. He agreed, and we were able to find the 1986 yearbook. I thumbed through the yearbook, and then froze when I found what I knew I was going to find. There was a memorial page to the fire victim, Kevin W. Anderson, born August 15th, 1967, and died April 6th, 1986. The smiling photo of Kevin looked exactly like the guy who had woken me up in my dorm the night of the fire. When quarantine started, I was actually pretty okay with it. I work from home one of the largest cybersecurity companies in the country, so there wasn't any loss in my pay. And the only thing that sucked was that I couldn't go to the gym. Luckily, I had a few dumbbells at home, and I made do with what I have. I'm also a female and 28 years old. Everything seemed pretty okay, actually. I don't have any family that lives close by and would go to my friend's place every now and then and I tried to keep myself socially distanced. But things quickly changed when one night I was in my living room watching some late night TV on Netflix. At first it sounded like something was being moved around or scooted upstairs, but it was faint. I had to turn the volume down by this point on the TV to get a better listen, but it had stopped. I chalked it up to my imagination playing tricks on me and turned back on the TV. But almost as soon as I continued watching, the sound started again, but this time a little louder. That's when I decided to check my security camera on my phone. I went room by room and I still didn't see anything. Now these are not the best cameras in the world by any means, and they do have night vision built in and motion detection. They even record for a short while when they notice movement. So after that I decided it was probably something outside and went to bed shortly after. After I woke up, I forgot all about the last night, and continued my day as usual. I went online for a few hours to do my work, had some coffee, and did my little at-home workout. And lately around 2 p.m. I would go for a run for about an hour to get out of the house and stretch my legs. After my run, I get back home and decide to take a shower. But that's when I noticed the floor of my bathtub was wet, and I hadn't taken a shower the night before but everything else in the bathroom looked normal. None of my towels had been touched from what I could tell. I looked around my house again and everything seemed normal. But as I went back to take a shower and get the water started, my phone security alert went off. I was already half naked at this point and when I opened the app, my jaw almost hit the floor. From what I could see, it looked like maybe a man in his late forties in my guest bedroom coming out of the closet. And for your mind's eye, my house has two bathrooms, one upstairs and one downstairs. The guest room was down the hall from the bathroom I was in. 
and the only way downstairs was to go past that room. I didn't know what to do and just continued to stare at my screen. The man was now holding something in his right hand and went back into the closet. I watched on for about three minutes and I couldn't see any movement. By then I had already put on my shorts again and top, and as quietly and quickly as I could, I went down the hall to the stairs. Now my house isn't the newest houses, so the stairs have spots that are really squeaky when you go down or up them. I already knew the spots that made the most noise, so I avoided them as best as I could. After getting down the stairs, I ran outside into my car, where I called the police. They came really fast, actually, and checked out the house. It must have been around ten minutes of waiting by the officer outside, while the others went inside. They finally came out with a man in handcuffs. It turns out he was homeless and had been staying in my attic for the past three weeks. After some questioning, they found out he had lived at the same house years before, and he knew the layout of it, and he knew about the attic that had an access point in the bedroom's closet. How he got past my cameras for so long, I will never know. I was having some issues with the app, and it didn't always work with motion detection. Now, he never actually did anything to me, and didn't try to hurt me or steal anything from what I could tell. Still just scares me as to what could have happened and how much more aware of my surroundings I need to have. I just hate that I need to feel like that in my own home. I'm of the ripe old age of 91, so as you can probably guess, we are going to have to go back quite a few years for this story. Back in 1957, I was 28 years young, and I was working as a door-to-door -door salesman for Howard and Lawrence Home Insurance. Back in those times, a door-to-door -door salesman was an honest living. You would have your fair share of turnaways, but at least you didn't get the door slammed in your face like you do now. My colleagues and I were working this remote neighborhood outside of Tyler, Texas. We would take turns knocking on doors, trying to sell the good people of Texas homeowners insurance policies. Our initial sweeps to the neighborhood were unsuccessful, but I was ambitious. At this time in my life, I had been married for a year, and my eldest was only six months old, so that commission pay I would receive by closing a deal was a priority for me. There was this two-story cypress house with some horse stables out front and stood out to me because most of the dwellings up to this point had been for simple living and the owners of this place looked like they were better off as it were. So I viewed it as a golden opportunity. As I was approaching the house, I got this unnerving feeling deep inside. But I ignored this feeling and did what I came there to do. Lawrence homeowners insurance and I speak to the man of the house anybody home there did not appear to be anyone in the house had it been any other day I would have most likely just taken my leave but as I said earlier I was eager to make a deal I wanted to impress my superiors by being the first one to sell off a policy in this particular area so I figured that the homeowner was probably out back chopping some firewood or fixing a tractor I grew up on a farm myself, and I can tell you from experience, there is always work to be done somewhere. As I made my way around back, this uneasy feeling persisted. And that's when I saw it. There was something on the ground behind the side house. It looked like a bed sheet with blood stains on it, with a machete sticking out of the ground beside it. I didn't want to come to any rash conclusions. Perhaps it was a deer carcass or a dead hog. But something told me that I had to take a look. I had to see what was beneath the sheets. What I saw was truly horrifying. 
In utter shock, I stood and turned. And that's when I saw him. In a panic, I made a break for it. I knew that if I ran back the way I entered from, the man with the axe surely would have caught me. That left me with no choice but to take my chances in the forest behind the property. Upon entering, I seemed to have lost the man with the axe. He had been hot on my heels, closing in, but as soon as I crossed the tree line, he disappeared. It was now a game of cat and mouse. While I was wandering aimlessly among the trees, looking over my shoulder every five seconds, I heard another set of footsteps coming from somewhere nearby. So I quickly hid behind this large tree, hoping that the man would pass by, so I could discreetly head back in the direction of the house. The man walked right past the tree I was hiding behind. And as I was just about to make my move, the unthinkable happened. I panicked and stupidly went back to my hiding spot. I could now hear the man with the axe closing in. He knew exactly where I was. The only thing I could think to do was just to bow my head and pray. This man would most definitely bury that hatchet into my head, but it was my own fear that was my ultimate downfall. I didn't pray for my life to be spared. I asked God to forgive my sins and watch over my family. I remembered wondering if it would be over quickly. To my surprise, death never came, and I heard footsteps heading away from my hiding place. I got up and saw the man heading back towards the house. I simply didn't understand what was happening. I thought maybe I was already a ghost. but the pounding in my chest told me that I was still very much alive. I didn't know what to make of the situation, so I decided to hide out in these woods a while longer. After about an hour, the Texas heat finally got the best of me, and I eventually backtracked my way to the house. Maybe not the smartest move, but I figured that if the man was going to end me, he already had plenty of opportunity to do so. And besides, I had left my briefcase behind. When I finally made it back there, there was no sign of the man with the axe, or the bloody sheets. There was only a few red stains on the ground next to my briefcase. I took my leave, and reported this incident to the local sheriff. I found out that the old lady who lived at that house had recently passed away, and the place was unoccupied. The woman's son would come by every day to take care of the horses, but after seeing photos of him, I can say with certainty that he was not the man that I saw that day. The sheriff suggested that who I saw that day had been a poacher who was illegally hunting on that property, and me walking around in the Texas sun all day had caused me to see things. There had been no missing persons report filed anywhere around that area, and without a body, there wasn't really much the sheriff could do. Mind you, this was long before the times of forensic science or DNA testing, but I do know what I saw under those bedsheets. Someone had met a very gruesome end. It was ultimately this experience that made me quit being a door-to-door -door salesman. I couldn't tell you why the man with the axe didn't kill me. It's something that baffles me to this very day. I'm just grateful that I didn't end up in a bedsheet myself. I'm on mobile, so the format might be a little bit wonky. And just as a reference, I'm a transgender man and use he pronouns now, but to make this story easier, I'm going to refer to myself as a female. At the time, my name was Samantha. This happened to me when I was around 12, so if I'm 20 now, that would make this about 8 years ago. Every summer, I would spend the time with my grandparents, who lived up in the mountains in a very small mountainside town. It was one of those remote little towns where just about everyone knew each other, but it was as empty as it was close. We barely had any streetlights at the time, none by my house. You know, that sort of thing. 
My grandparents were also a tad bit irresponsible. They would often leave me at the house all alone whenever they needed to run errands in the city a few hours away. I was a pretty responsible kid, though, and so nothing bad ever happened. Until one summer evening. One summer's evening, I took a glass of iced tea outside so I could sit on the porch and watch the sun set. I was minding my own business, sitting there all alone, when all of a sudden I heard a voice call out to me. Hey you, little lady. The voice was sort of thick and raspy, like this person had been chain-smoking for 40 years straight. I look up, and there's a man at the end of the driveway. To this day, his image is burned into my mind. He was tall. He towered over me at about six foot five, if I had to wager a guess. He was wearing a pair of overalls that were caked in grime and dirt, and what I would later learn to be animal blood. A white wife beater that was torn all to hell, muddy black boots, and somehow a completely pristine silver watch. He was an older man, maybe about fifty or sixty, and his eyes were a sharp blue. His face was so wrinkled up that it reminded me of a walrus. His hair was gray with light streaks of blonde. He had a huge long beard and was mostly balding with long hair to his shoulders wherever he wasn't. He was also missing most of his teeth. If you're wondering how I got such a good look at him, I'll get to that in a moment. I didn't automatically assume the worst, even if this situation was very odd. I sort of replied with a non-committal, Yeah? He got closer to me, to the point where we were now only about ten feet apart. Do you have directions to 1234 Forest Lane? He asked. That was my address. Uh, that's here, this house. Are you looking for my grandparents? They aren't home today. Big mistake. My naive self thought nothing bad of this entire situation. He nodded, and this, this grin formed on his face. It was positively toothless and genuinely sinister. It was then that it clicked that something wasn't quite right. Good, very good. The man looked all around. It occurred to me that none of my neighbors were home. Most were out to dinner or staying late at work. It was a Friday night after all. My stomach sank. The man looked back at me and seemed to scan me up and down. You're a very pretty girl, he said simply. Too pretty to be underage, I reckon. That made me start to shake. I was frozen in my steps, and here is this man who took a few steps closer. He then asked me a question that chilled me to my core, and to this day, it still haunts me. Are you afraid to die, Samantha? He knew my name. I had never seen this man before in my entire life, but somehow he knew my name. That's what scared me the most. I very wisely decided to get the fuck out of Dodge, and I ran into the house, slamming the glass screen door and locking it. A side note, our front door is a sliding glass door. It's weird, I know. He stood maybe about three feet away from the door, and after that we just stared at each other. In my head, I thought, I don't know if any of the other windows or doors are locked. He knew that I was thinking that, and so we stood in a standoff, just staring. I got a very good look at the man, everything from the smallest toe to the very top of his head. Each of us stood there, barely moving, seeming to be in an endless game of red light, green light and whoever moved first would lose everything. The sun was setting. It felt like an eternity, but in reality we were maybe only there for ten minutes tops. Every thirty seconds, it would get just a little bit darker, and darker, and darker. The man was slowly becoming just a silhouette, and then he was starting to disappear. No streetlights, no neighbors, no witnesses. I began to tear up and shake. I was so scared. I don't think I've ever been more scared in my entire life. Was I going to die here? I was so young, and there was so much I still wanted to do. If he ran to get in, what would I do next? Would I go back outside and try to make a run for the gas station up the street? 
would I try to hide and outlast him until my grandparents arrived? If so, where could I hide? And then, by some grace of God, at that exact moment, my grandparents arrived home. The headlight shined on the man, or at least, that's where he should have been. Somehow, he was already long gone. I ran to my grandparents, sobbing and telling them the entire story. They called the police, but there wasn't much they could do. A few years later, I was at my grandparents' house once again. I woke up from a good night's sleep and wandered off into the kitchen, serving myself some breakfast that my grandma had made. I sat at the table right next to my grandpa. Wordlessly, he handed me the paper that he was reading. Front page, above the fold, there was a mugshot of the man I had encountered that day. He was a butcher in a remote town just a few hours away, convicted for killing and committing necrophilia on the bodies of his wife and three kids, then butchering them into pieces and throwing them out deep into the woods. He apparently was also under investigation for various murders, all of which involved dismemberment. I have no idea if anyone else saw this man or knows about the case off the top of their heads, but if you do, it would be really interesting to hear about and maybe read that news article again. Now, I wouldn't be surprised since this is so fucking sinister in nature. Apparently, he only killed women, and if he truly did dismember all those people... I would fit his victim profile to a T. Young female, dark hair, dark eyes, and of native or Hispanic origin. My grandfather took back the newspaper after I was done reading it, and in trying to conceal how shaken he was, he put a hand on my shoulder and said, I'm so happy to have you here, kid. This story starts on a Thursday night in May of 2017. I work in retail, and after a long shift one night, I called an Uber home so I could avoid the dodgy people that hang around the train station. I wish I had known that this simple act of calling for transportation would lead to a six-month-long ordeal of harassment and obsession. I got into the car and chatted with the middle-aged driver, who I'll call T. He had a strong Turkish accent and seemed very friendly. The conversation was normal at first, with him asking where I worked and why I was out so late, what I was studying, etc. As the conversation progressed, though, he began to make comments that started to make me feel uncomfortable. He started to comment on how pretty I was, how young I looked, and how he missed the times when he was young and could get with girls like me. Then he put his hand on my knee and patted it affectionately. He tried to push the hair out of my face. I was very aware that he was controlling a moving vehicle with me in it, so I had just ignored him and prayed that we would get to our destination quicker. When he pulled up to our place, he noticed a car was in the driveway and immediately retracted his hand. He asked me if I wanted to go out for a coffee sometime. I politely declined, said that I had a partner. He told me that he was a lucky man and that I could call him any time for a free ride. He then reached out and kissed my hand. I felt physically sick, but thanked him for the ride and hopped out as quickly as I could. As soon as I was inside, I told my boyfriend what had happened, and he encouraged me to report the driver. I was apprehensive at first as he knew our address, but eventually I reported it as I knew we were moving soon. I was reassured by Uber that the matter would be investigated thoroughly and received a full refund for the trip. I didn't hear anything from T after that and was soon busy into my own study schedule, working and moving house. I had forgotten all about him until around August or by chance I ran into him in our cafe. I was in line to get a coffee when he tapped me on the shoulder. My heart sank. He gave me a big smile and tried to give me a hug, which I declined. Hey, I've missed your pretty face. Where have you been? I'm super busy. Sorry, I can't really talk. I sputtered out. I ordered my coffee hastily and burst out the door with him hot on my trail. He started walking beside me, matching my pace. I was starting to breathe heavily and hyperventilate. Hey, so I could have bought you that coffee. 
we still need to go on that coffee date sometime. I told him no. I wasn't interested and he was making me uncomfortable. He grabbed my hand as we were walking. What the fuck are you doing? He replied. Oh, is that too soon? Too soon? Too soon for what? We're not on a date and I'm not interested. Leave me alone. I said this loudly enough for people around me to hear me and a few people had started to pay attention. Oh, are you a lesbian or something? No, I'm just not interested in you. I was mortified. I had officially lost it and started to cry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. He tried to pat me on the back. I physically flinched and walked away from him, close to having a mental breakdown. He called out behind me as I was leaving. You still work at that shoe store, right? I realized then that I told him where I had worked that night and that he had picked me up and seen me in uniform. I also told him where and what I studied. I couldn't believe my own stupidity. I alerted my store manager, who then alerted shopping center security. They assured me that they would be on the lookout. Sure enough, my first shift back after the cafe run-in, my manager told me that someone had come in asking for my phone number, and when I was next on shift claiming to be my boyfriend. My manager refused to give this information and immediately notified security, but by the time they arrived he had already left long ago. They showed me the grainy center security footage of people coming into our store around that time, and sure enough it was T. I was told that if he came in again to go hide out in the back, and that the other girls on shift would deal with him. A few months later he even tried to add me on Facebook. I immediately changed my name on Uber so I couldn't be identified anymore, I have a pretty unique name, and blocked him right away. The most recent incident happened in September last year. I was tidying the window display out the front of the store when I immediately felt like I was being watched. I looked to my left and sure enough T was there. I pretended not to know him and just said, can I help you with something sir? Just admiring your beauty, he said with a smile. He then gave me an envelope and walked out before I could say anything. Inside was a card saying that he really felt a deep connection and thanking me for my help today, even though I never even served him. Inside was a voucher for the local bikini store for $100. I've included photos and blanked out the parts that might give my identity away. Anyways, I realize now is the time to involve the police, and I'm kicking myself for not contacting them in the first place. I haven't heard from him since, and I'm praying that I don't ever hear from him again. Should I still involve the police, even though it's been a while since we last made contact? I was roughly 19 years old when this story occurred. I'm a tall male around 6 foot 1, and I was living with my parents at the time. For reference, I live in a fairly condensed region of my country, and luckily for me, I live on the more lavish side of town in a rather large house. However, due to where I am, burglaries and home invasions are not a rare occasion, and I knew at some point it would happen to me, but that didn't make it any less petrifying. My parents wanted to have a romantic week in a way as their jobs have kept them very busy and they felt very much stressed. I gladly obliged as I wished to have the house to myself so I could play games until my eyes went square. They gave me about 50 euros for food and essentials and quickly sped off to the awaiting taxi. The rest of the afternoon went fairly quickly and a couple of hours passed and I'm on my PC with a couple of my mates. I looked over at my bedside table and my dated alarm clock read 1am. I slowly rubbed my eyes and I decided I was too tired to continue playing my games. I told my mates that I was heading off and pressed the power button listening out for the final sound of the whirring fan to die out. I headed downstairs to get a glass of water, but then as I was grabbing the glass I heard a slow, inconsistent tapping over at my window. This obviously confused me as it was so sudden, but the area I live in is known for foxes to try and get in to get food, so I checked the door, it was locked, and headed upstairs. The tapping eventually stopped and I sighed a long sigh of relief as the sound was beginning to aggravate me. I was lying in my bed trying to get to sleep but 
Roughly half an hour later, I was awoken to the same scratching sounds. But this time, it was at my window. Now, I've read enough horror stories and creepypastas to know looking out my curtain was a horrendously horrible idea. However, this was bugging me, so I crept over to my curtain and slowly pulled it back, dreading what was on the other side. My stomach lifted as I was greeted with nothing, but at the same time I closed them, I heard the shatter of glass in the kitchen. I was terrified. I heard the sound of thick, heavy footsteps coming up the stairs. I snapped out of my frozen state and quickly closed and locked my door just as whatever was in my house got to the landing. I rummaged through my drawer for something to defend myself with. I unearthed an old Swiss army knife that my dad gave me when I joined the scouts years ago. All this time this person is kicking at my door. I picked up the knife and jumped into my closet. Not too long after, I hear the sound of my door finally giving up and letting this person in. I look through the gap. I saw a rugged man standing in my room, virtually foaming at the mouth with a rage that I had never seen before. His eyes were bloodshot, a deep crimson, and he was throwing my things, searching for me. I knew I had to act. I finalized on the idea that if this psycho came to my closet, I was going to stab him. He came over to my closet and I knew the inevitable was going to happen. He pulled open my closet door and I was greeted with this man who had menace in his eyes. I took no chances and plunged my blade into his chest, penetrating through his bone, letting out a blood-curdling scream before collapsing to the floor. I ran so fast out of my house I got carpet burn along the bottom of my feet. I rushed to my neighbors as quickly as I could and explained to them the situation and they called the cops. I stood outside my house as they dragged the ragged man out. Needless to say, I stayed at my neighbor's house as all this insanity was sorted out. I'm posting this story on a throwaway because I'm embarrassed about how I handled this whole situation and I don't really want it connected to my real name. I'll start with some background. I'm a 20-year-old college student, and my brother is 17. This story happened over summer, so at the time I was home from college. Our parents were out of town because it was their 25th anniversary, and they decided to take a little vacation, leaving me and my bro home alone. That was fine by us, though. We spent most of the time drinking beer and playing Mario Party. During one of our game sessions... I showed my brother all of these texts I had been getting from a guy that I had gone to high school with. I didn't think much of them. They were mostly just weak attempts at flirting. Occasionally, he would say something about one of my Facebook posts or about seeing me somewhere around town. But I thought overall it was pretty harmless. My little brother seemed really concerned, though. He pointed out that the guy was texting me at least seven times a day. He told me if I ever needed him... All I had to do was text him the word help, and he'd come no matter what. I laughed at him. I said he was being paranoid. Obviously, that sort of thing could never happen to me. I was very wrong. Two days after we had that conversation, my brother was over at his girlfriend's house, which was about five minutes away, so I was completely alone at home. Me being the dummy I am, I posted on Facebook, home alone tonight. Huh. <sighs> About 45 seconds after posting it, I got a message from the guy saying that he could be over at my house in five minutes and he really wanted to spend time with me. I told him no, but thanked him for offering. He responded by saying it was already too late because he was headed there already. I told him no again, but he just kept insisting that I spend time with him. He said he had something special planned for us tonight. Again, I wasn't interested. He responded, Too late. I'm already here. I went to my front door and opened it, only to see him standing there to my surprise, holding a bottle of very expensive red wine. I noticed that the bottle had been opened already, but the entire container was still full. Now we get to the part that I'm a bit embarrassed about. Somehow, after a while of talking... I let him convince me to let him inside. Once he was in, though, 
I started to notice things off right away, because he poured two glasses of wine. I didn't touch mine, because I noticed that he wouldn't touch his at all. He kept insisting that I drink mine, to the point of being angry that I wouldn't even try. It was about this time that I realized I had made a grave mistake. I excused myself and went to the bathroom, where I took the opportunity to text my brother. When I left, I noticed the man had stood up, and his eyes were locked on to me. He looked furious. He mumbled something. I wish you had just done this the easy way. He started moving towards me, and I froze. His eyes looked like those of an animal. I completely froze up. I wanted to fight and scream, but I just couldn't move my body at all. He grabbed me and forced me to the floor, but even still I didn't fight. I shut my eyes and waited for the inevitable, but just then a miracle occurred. I heard the door burst open. My brother came flying in from the outside, calling out to me and asking if I was all right. My attacker stood up and tried to run, but my brother grabbed him and wrestled him to the ground. He pinned my attacker down and said the single most intimidating thing I've heard him say in his life. If you text her again, I'll hurt you. If you look at her again, I'll hurt you. And if you touch her, I'll kill you. He dragged the guy out of our house and threw him face first to the pavement. Thankfully, I never heard from the guy again. After talking to my bro later that night, I learned that his girlfriend's parents weren't home that night so he skipped out on definitely having sex just to come save me without a single question. For starters, my name is Rose, and I'm 19. I'm from the Netherlands, and I study law. I mainly chose to go to law school because of this occurrence. I was only 16 at the time. I was what the Americans would call a sophomore in high school. I was, and still am very picky with who I choose to be friends with. So I had about five real friends at the time. This is very important for the story. It all started one night when I decided to go out to the only bar in my town that allowed 16 year olds inside. We weren't allowed to drink, but we had pre-gamed, so whatever. It's very common in Holland for teenagers to start drinking at the age of 16. I was out with about three of my friends, and for the sake of the story I'll call them Jordan, Lisa, and Maddie. I was dating Jordan at this time. He was 19. Jordan brought his younger brother along, who was 16. We will call him Joe. We were all just hanging out and having fun, and I noticed that I got along very well with Joe. In the days following, I started to receive texts from Joe. He was saying stuff like, Hey, let's go out again soon. I brushed it off as him trying to be friendly, as he didn't have a whole lot of friends from what I've heard. Joe and I developed a great friendship over the following months. I came over a lot and hung out with Joe, Jordan, and their parents, and I developed a good bond with them as well. After a few weeks, I began to receive random phone calls. I would pick up and say, Hi, this is Rose. But the person on the other end of the line wouldn't say anything. The only thing I would hear was just heavy breathing. I thought it was a prank at first, but when that number called me 30 to 40 times in two hours, I was starting to become a little frightened. I went from calling every once in a while to being called about 60 times a day. I tried blocking the number, but as soon as I did, a new number would call me. And when I would answer, the only thing I would hear would be that same heavy breathing. I eventually told my parents and they thought it was strange, but they didn't take me serious. When I told Jordan, Maddie, and Joe, however, they took it extremely serious. The phone calls eventually stopped for a while, and the whole thing just slowly seeped into the back of my mind, and eventually I rarely ever thought about them. That was until I was out shopping with Maddie. I received another phone call. However, I had just recently applied for a job, and I thought it may have been the company calling me. I picked it up, and I immediately felt my heart pounding in my chest as I heard a muffled voice saying, My sweet Rose, you look so gorgeous in your green jacket. It really brings out your blue eyes. I freaked out 
and started to look around. I was brought out of my initial panic as I heard the voice say, Don't bother. You can't see me, but I can clearly see you. I hung up after that. I took the bus home that day in tears, with Maddie being as freaked out as I was. I told my parents, and yet again, they brushed it off. They told me it was probably a prank phone call. So I was left thinking, if it was just a prank phone call, then why would the caller make sure his number wasn't visible? This went on for months, and I fell into a 24-7 state of paranoia. I was scared to leave the house, and I didn't eat a whole lot, and I would just stay in bed all day if I could. Of course, I had school, and at this time, I was getting at least 40 phone calls every day. Jordan, Maddie, and Joe, and eventually my parents, were my biggest supporters through this whole thing. At least one of them would pick me up and drop me off at home, and if my parents were at work, someone would stay home with me until my parents came home, just to make sure that I was safe. However, things took a turn for the worst when all of my friends started receiving the same phone calls and the caller also started blowing up my house phone. I would leave my phone at home a lot when I went to school. Either Joe, Jordan, or Maddie would let my parents know where I was. I also started receiving these weird, twisted love letters. One of them read, Hello, Rosie. You looked so beautiful the other day. With all your hair curled up like that, it made me want to cut some of it off. I wish I could just cut your whole beautiful head off. But I can't do that. You would just be too quiet for me. I have thought about it though. Cutting your head off and taking out your eyeballs. Those baby blue eyes of yours. I will see you soon. Sooner than you think. I have tears in my eyes just from reading it. After many, many phone calls, and me either declining or just not picking up, I had the guts to pick up the phone, and I told the caller that I wanted to meet them. I wasn't planning on going alone, so Joe offered to come with me, since Jordan had to work and Maddie had dance practice. So we rode our bikes to a nearby park, where I had agreed to meet the caller. I sat down on a bench with my heart nearly beating out of my chest, Joe hid in the bushes behind me with a baseball bat in case the caller tried to grab me or hurt me. And of course, nobody showed. We waited for around two hours for nothing. After I got back home, I received another phone call. This time, the caller wasn't as sweet as he usually was. He called me a dumb bitch and a whore. He told me that he was disappointed in me for thinking that he was so stupid that he would not notice that I brought Joe along. I hung up, and from that point on, all the phone calls I received were violent, with the caller threatening to kill me or hurt my family. He also told me that he was the one for me, and that Jordan was just a phase. I went to go grab my bike so I could make my way to the police station, and that's when I noticed that there was a shoebox tied to it. I immediately started to panic. I opened it up, and there was a dead rat inside. I remember screaming at the top of my lungs, and then I broke down crying. With the box still attached to my bike, I took off to the police station. It usually took me about 30 minutes from my house to get to the station. However, on that day, it only took me 15. I gave them my statement, and they took it extremely serious. They placed a wiretap on my phone and the phones of my friends and my parents shortly after. I let everyone know. Only after a few weeks of silence, the phone call started again. The caller told me that he knew about the police listening into the conversations. He also said that he was going to come by my house at night, kill me, and then rape my dead body. I became numb at this point. Things had gotten so hopeless that I didn't see a point of living another day in this hell. I remember it like it was just yesterday. It was on the 19th of July, 2016. I had just turned 17, and I was over at Jordan's house. I was actually kind of relaxed in some weird way. The police kept me updated on everything they found. Jordan and I were on the couch, when suddenly the doorbell rang. 
Jordan opened the front door to three cops standing just outside. One of them was the detective that I had the most contact with. He was in charge of the investigation, I think. He came straight over to me and grabbed my hands, looked me dead in the eyes, and told me two simple words. It's over. I couldn't believe what he was saying at first. The other two officers went upstairs as I was talking to the detective. When they came back down, Joe was in handcuffs. At first, I thought it was a mistake, but as soon as I saw Joe's defeated face, I became infuriated. I screamed at Joe, asking him why. Jordan was yelling at him as well. He was shocked at first, but as soon as he understood the situation, he freaked out. Jordan's mom began crying, and honestly, I felt bad for her. Soon after, the cops left with Joe. The detective stayed behind and explained to us that Joe had bought prepaid SIM cards and used them on an old phone that he had laying around. He told me that he knew it was Joe when they listened to a very bizarre conversation he had on the phone. Apparently, Joe dialed his house number with his prepaid phone. He made sure that he was the one that picked up the house phone. He yelled at the phone, screaming that the caller was a coward. I know it sounds insane, but Joe was the only one talking, so that made it crystal clear, and it also explains why the caller never showed up that day at the park. He was already there. Joe was taken into custody and was sentenced to two years in prison. He was released last year while he was incarcerated. I did visit him once to get answers to some of the questions I had. Joe told me that he was in love with me and wanted nothing more than to be with me. He told me that he was sorry for putting me through so much misery, but I don't think I can ever forgive him. Jordan and I are no longer together. I just couldn't face him anymore. Every single time I looked at him, I was reminded of Joe and the pain that he put me through. Thankfully, me and Jordan are still on friendly terms. I'm still in therapy because of all of this. I just really don't know how to move forward. The only thing I know for sure is that I never want to see Joe ever again. So, I work at a small McDonald's in an even smaller town in the south, and I've encountered many strange people and seen some fucked up things so far. But I saw something today that I thought I would never see and was shocked at how many people didn't notice or didn't care about what was taking place right next to them. I was working behind the counter at around 7 p.m. and we had lots of people in the lobby, a few children as well. I like kids so usually I watch them play around in the lobby because they're really cute, but I got distracted by the large amount of customers we had to serve and ignored them for about 15 minutes. I looked back though, when I heard a man ask in a small voice, almost whispering. So, how old are you? I turn around to see this extremely tall guy with a shaved head and red shirt, talking to a little girl who looked to be about five or six. He had a little boy around the same age on his shoulders, who was giggling. They were beautiful children with blonde hair and blue eyes. I saw that they were happy, and that the guy seemed friendly but something in my head was extremely worried. I had a huge suspicion upon seeing this, that these kids were not his. What grown man would ask a little girl how old she is? And if he knew who they were, wouldn't he already know? Why would he care? But after this, he said something that made my heart sink. You should come with me now. I have a little brother who's six too. Let's go play with him. He then began to walk to the exit with the boy on his shoulders, and the girl tagging along. I immediately shot for the door to stop him, just as a lady with blonde hair came out of the bathroom shouting, Hey! Where are you going? Get over here! The tall guy froze with eyes as big as saucers. He was fucking petrified. The lady then scooped up the little girl in her arm, and reaches for the boy as the tall guy lets him down, stammering, Oh, I, I was just playing with your kids. They're really nice kids. I just really like kids. All at once, with a nervous smile, the blonde lady then faked a smile back, but still had eyes that clearly said, Stay the fuck away from my children, you fucking creep. But her mouth ended up saying, Oh, 
Well, I'm glad you had a nice time, but we need to order now. She then led her kids to the back of the restaurant. The tall guy hurried out of the front exit, and the lady clutched her kids close to her the entire time she was there, even in their booth. If I ever see that guy at work again, I will immediately call the cops on him. Who knows what would have happened to those kids if I wasn't looking, or well, their mother hadn't come out of the bathroom at that very second. I think it's awful that she left her kids unattended in a full restaurant lobby, but no one deserves to lose their children to a disgusting creep with a sick grin like that. This story takes place a few months ago when quarantine started. I was living with my boyfriend and his friend at the time in a not so nice apartment. Now we're all young adults, me and my boyfriend both 20, and his friend a little older 24. For anonymity's sake, I will call my boyfriend Jake and his friend Steven. Now me and Jake have been dating for about 3 years now and got together in high school. Steven was more of a new friend that we both met at a local comic book store a few months back. Now we all decided to get an apartment together, so we could all move out of our parents' places. It was really great at first. There was no drama, bills, were being paid on time, and things seemed pretty nice despite the recent COVID events. But one day when Jake was at the apartment by himself, he hears a loud banging on the door. When he went to check out who it was, there was nobody there. Jake said that it honestly sounded like someone was trying to break down the door from how hard they were knocking. Now, he kind of dismissed this and went back to watching TV. A few nights later, I was at the apartment by myself, when I too heard a loud banging at the door, and the sounds of a man's voice outside saying something I couldn't hear too well. I texted Jake telling him about this and what was happening. And that's when he told me about the same situation that had happened to him a few days prior. I was honestly pretty scared because of the apartments we live in. A lot of people who are here are either drug addicts or dealers. Now we don't party or do anything like that. But we also don't make the most money. So this is what we could afford together. I don't think it was necessary to call the police at this point because I don't really like dealing with them in the first place. I'm an African American female and live in a more racist part of Colorado by the way. I waited for a bit longer all the while texting my boyfriend. Then the banging stopped. I went to the door to look into the peephole and nobody was there. I didn't actually feel like looking outside because if someone was still there, I didn't want to know their intentions. After a few more hours, Stephen comes home after work and tells me that he too had heard loud banging noises while he was in the shower the other day when he was home alone. We don't always get days off together because our work schedules are not set schedules. Now I'm pretty scared now and I'm on high alert. I don't go anywhere because of the lockdown besides work right now. And this next part kind of sealed the deal with calling the police. Me and Jake were laying down at night. Steven was still at work. And we're watching My Hero Academia on Hulu. All of a sudden the knocking starts again. But it stops almost as soon as it started. Me and Jake just looked at each other and went to the window by the door to peek out and see. What we saw was four guys standing outside of the apartment door. Now two of them had hoodies on and the other two we couldn't get a good look at. I decided to take a picture with my phone just in case I needed to report them to the apartment's office or the police. Now this next part was kind of my fuck up, but as I took the picture the flash went off. Now when I tell you my stomach hit the floor. I literally mean it. I jumped down onto the ground and clenched my teeth together, while Jake looked at me with wide eyes. The guys outside had to have seen the flash because it was practically point blank in their faces. The knocks on the door became kicks now, and the guys who were outside were yelling at us to open the door, or else. I feel like a big baby, but I was just screaming for them to stop. Jake, on the other hand, ran to the bedroom, where he grabbed his pistol that his dad had gave him. Without warning, Jake had ran to the front door and unloaded the clip into the door. After this, they ran away pretty fast, and when Stephen got home, he said that there was a lot of blood outside the door, and called the police when he saw it. It turns out that the men were caught later that night, because they had went to the hospital close by, and when he gets shot and goes to the ER, the police are notified. We still don't know who they are or what they wanted. Only three of them were arrested, and the other has yet to be found. I'm not really sure what to do at this point, but I feel like just writing this down has helped a lot.
To give some background information, this event occurred a little over a year ago, and I still haven't been able to even begin to get over it. I'm a 22-year-old, 5'4 female, and at the time I was 21. My family and I had recently moved to a new town that was a fair amount more rural than the town I had previously lived in. Our house was a large ranch-style house with a basement. I was home from college, and my parents had left for the week to celebrate their wedding anniversary with their friends, who lived several hours away. Before I continue, I'll give a quick layout of the house so that you'll be able to imagine the setting a bit more clearly. There were three doors which led into the house. One on the front porch, a sliding glass door on the back porch, which did have a lock and floor-length curtains for privacy, and another door on the other side of the wall from which my bedroom led into the garage and basement. When you walk out of my bedroom and turn, you can see all the way across the house, through the kitchen, living room, and dining area, to the door of my parents' bedroom, and the stairs leading up from the basement. At this point, it had been a few days since my parents had left, and so far I hadn't had any problems. They had sent me a couple of messages on Facebook, letting me know that they had arrived to their friend's house safely, and were having a very good time. The day had gone pretty well, and I was sure to check that I had locked all the doors of the house once the sun started to go down. It was about 11pm, and I was doing my nightly routine of staying in bed and messing around on the computer, when I suddenly got this sinking feeling of dread. It felt as if I was being watched. It was summer, and we didn't have AC, so I had a large box fan in the window, blowing the cool night air into my stiflingly hot room. But once that feeling settled over me, I decided that maybe I should remove the fan and close the window just to be safe. Once removing the fan, shutting and locking the window, and pulling down the curtain, I felt a bit better. However, I still could not shake the feeling of dread. I lay back down in my bed and tried to continue what I was doing, although I never put my headphones back on. After only a few minutes, I began to hear something that sounded like a light scratching. I sat still in bed, listening to the sound and trying to pinpoint what it was and if I recognized the noise at all. Our new house, although relatively close in distance to our neighbors, had a fair amount of forest all around it. I thought the scratching may have been an animal, or just someone's dog that got loose and wanted to come inside. After a few minutes, the scratching stopped, and everything returned to complete silence. At this point, I figured that I was probably right, and that it must have been an animal. My relief was short-lived, though, as soon after the scratching stopped, from the other side of the wall, I began to hear footsteps slowly descending into my basement. This is when I knew I was completely fucked. There was no way I could get out of the house without walking past the basement stairs. We didn't have a house phone, and at the time I was in the process of getting a new cell phone because mine was broken beyond repair. I sat there for a few seconds, just wondering what the hell I should do. I knew that I would need to get out of the house as soon as possible, and that the more time I wasted, the worse it would end up being for me. I contemplated popping the screen out of my bedroom window and jumping out, but it was far enough off the ground that there was a good chance I would end up getting hurt if I did so. Not to mention that if I jumped out the window and hurt myself, I wouldn't be able to run for help, and I would be right next to the door that whoever was in my house had just gone in through. I decided, very carefully and quietly, to open my door and peek out around the corner. If the coast was clear, I would make a mad dash for the front door and sprint to my neighbor's house for help. I very slowly opened my bedroom door, letting my eyes adjust to the darkness of the house, before creeping around the corner and looking to see if it was safe to make a run for it. What I saw nearly made me vomit. As my eyes scanned the house, I noticed that something was off. I squinted as hard as I could and looked over at the basement stairs. I started to be able to make out the shape of a man. What made it worse? He wasn't just standing at the top of the stairs. He was crawling up them like some kind of demonic creature. 
I quickly backed into my room again, shutting and locking the door as quietly as I could. I didn't think he'd seen me, but there was no way I was going to make a run for it now. My only choice was to pop the screen and jump out the window. As I was unlocking and opening my window, I heard the handle to my bedroom door turn. Once the man realized it was locked, in a sickeningly sweet sing-song voice he cooed. I know you're in there. This was followed by a loud cackle, and what I can only imagine was him throwing himself at full force against my door. I ripped the screen out of the window and flung myself out. Unfortunately, I landed on the wrong side of my right foot, and I was sure I'd just badly hurt my ankle. At the time, I couldn't think of anything other than getting as far away as possible. I got up and hobbled as fast as I could to my neighbor's house, knocking on their door in a panicked frenzy and ringing the bell over and over. I looked over at my house as I was yelling for my neighbors to let me in. I swear to fucking God, I could see the man standing at my window, waving at me. My neighbors finally opened the door after what felt like forever, and I managed to explain well enough what was going on for them to let me in and call the police. I stayed with them until the police arrived. The police searched my house and found that the lock to the basement had been picked and that the door to my bedroom was hanging off the hinges. They weren't able to find the man anywhere, and because I had only seen him for a split second in the dark, I couldn't provide them with a good description of him. Of course, I got into contact with my parents immediately, and they hurried right home. The police took my statement and searched the area for the man, but of course they came up with nothing. After this event, my parents and I were sure to add deadbolt locks to the door leading into the basement and to the door leading out of the basement to the rest of the house. They also helped me pay to get a new phone. What really bothers me about all of this, though, is that nothing was stolen. There wasn't even any evidence that the man had looked through anything, all the while he'd been inside my house. I'm someone who goes on the deep and dark web constantly. It's not what people think. Where it's evil and overpopulated with crazy people. That's only a small percentage of the dark web. Years ago, my girlfriend broke up with me and I put her personal information on the forum. And soon after that, she disappeared. It's been a while since that happened. And I've ran into people that have disrespected me since. I'm not an intimidating guy nor do I look intimidating, nor do I ever have physical or verbal conflicts. I always think to myself that these people don't know what could happen to them. I work at a fast food restaurant, and at the time of this story, my manager was really on my case about everything. I would be late, mess up orders, have an attitude with customers, and some other stuff I could name, but it's so much. I understood that I was messing up, but... The tone that this guy would talk to me embarrassed me in front of my co-workers and sometimes in front of customers. One day though, that was the last straw. So one day I walked into work, five minutes before I was due to clock in and my manager out loud said that the window liquor is finally on time in front of customers and my co-workers. Everyone laughed at me. During my whole shift that night, he would direct smart comments toward me while still yelling at me for everything that I did wrong. I made up my mind. I was going to find that forum and give his information. On my walk home, I was going back and forth with myself about whether to do it or not. By the time I made it home, I made up my mind. I didn't shower nor did I change clothes. I went straight to my laptop and I searched. I possibly clicked maybe a hundred links because on a dark web there are links that will take you down any rabbit hole. A link named Porkchop piqued my interest. When I clicked it, I was directed to an about page. It only said six words. We find it, we chop it. And another link that said, here's an example of what we do. I clicked it, of course. As soon as I clicked on it, the picture went to the point of view from an old school camera with the date and time in the corner of the screen. The person behind the camera approached the man and followed him. A few minutes go by and the man noticed what was happening. He turned around and approached the camera while yelling and screaming at the person for following him. Then all of a sudden you see five huge guys dressed in black wearing a pig mask run from behind the man. 
and drag them into the dark. The person holding the camera turns the camera to his or her face and leaves it there for about five to 10 minutes. That person also wore a pig mask, but all you could hear was the man screaming and sounds that I don't want to describe in the background. The camera was then turned back around and the sight that I saw was disturbing. It was something that no one would ever want to see. Some people say that they wouldn't wish it on their worst enemy, but I did. After the video was over, there were links. One said pork and the other said chop. I clicked on the pork and it prompted me to put in a code. I didn't have one so I backed out. So I clicked on chop. There was information that needed to be filled out, like name, height, description, and place. I filled out all the info for my manager. In the place, it was my job. I submitted the form. At the end of the screen, it said, see you soon. Four days later, while at work, my manager approached me and decided to apologize for the way he treated me and offered to give me more hours and said that he will work with me more often because he sees potential in me. A few hours later, it was close to the end of the night. My manager helped me with the trash and took it out for me. As I were putting chairs on top of the table getting ready to mop, I looked outside and saw my manager looking over at something, but he looked worried. I moved to get a better look and I saw what he was looking at. He was surrounded by six people in a pig mask with weapons in their hands. I ran outside as they swarmed him, except for one person. He had a camera. I forgot all about these guys and then I put his information on the website. I ran outside as they approached him. He looked at me for help, but I ran back inside and called the police. It took them 10 minutes to get there. When I looked back outside, what I saw was the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. I wish I could get the image out of my head. Between the time of me initially seeing them, calling the cops and running back outside, these guys were gone, but my manager was still there. I went to his funeral the next week. The next day I received an anonymous email that had the whole video. They were watching him this whole time he was on shift. I don't know how they got my email. I never provided any of my information. Till this day, I still feel sick because my manager was starting to be nice to me that day. I can't go back on the dark web. <laughs> been sitting here at my computer for about 30 minutes now, trying to figure out what to say or how to put this into words. I work at a local CrossFit gym in San Diego, California. Now since quarantine started, the rules and regulations have gotten pretty strict. We do the best we can to keep everything clean and everyone at least six feet apart, but they still have shut us down. So it's just been me by myself at the gym a few hours a day to do maintenance in the building and equipment. Things have been fairly quiet around here since then, besides a few phone calls a day and asking for open. Now things started to get a little more interesting, if that's how you could put it. When I would come into the open gym and notice little things moved around, at first it was just some towels that I had folded and put away. I chalked it up to me not paying attention and perhaps the other manager who worked there, but he only came in very little because most of his work was done from home. Then a few days later, I noticed that weights were moved around too. Now this building is more of a warehouse setting and it's not super fancy. We don't have any cameras or alarms in the building, just a set of keys that works for the front and back of the gym. I called up the other manager after seeing this to ask him if he knew of anything about the weights being moved. I wasn't sure if he was letting in some friends at night to use the gym or what was going on. Of course he said no and knew nothing about it and that he hasn't been to the local gym in weeks. And that's about the time I noticed a car pass by the front of the store. Now if you were to drive by the location we're at, you wouldn't see anyone out there. All the other businesses that were next door have closed up, and no one's working at them. So to see a car drive by was extremely strange. I looked out the window and noticed a car again drive by to the back of the gym. Now I ride a bike to work because it's better on the environment and because I'm a cheapskate. So nobody would tell that anyone's at the store, unless you called or went right to the front door and looked inside the windows. I had ran to the back of the gym and looked at the door where I noticed it start to unlock and a man walk right inside. I just stood there like, what the hell? 
we made eye contact and he said, Hello there. In a really deep voice. I wasn't sure what to say or who he was. I just replied, Hello there, sir. Can I help you? He said something along the lines of, No, but thank you. And turned around and went back out the door. Where I kind of followed along and just watched him get back in his car and drive away. Now, after turning back to the door, I noticed two things. One, the lock to the door looked extremely scratched and dented, like someone had broke it. And two, there was a note on the door that said today's date and time. I'm not really sure what to make of all this, but I've called the police already and I'm waiting for them to show up. It's not even a bad area I work at, but since quarantine started, people have been acting really dumb lately. So I wouldn't put it past some beef heads trying to break into the gym and get a pump. Anyways, that's my story. I'll update you guys if anything changes or more happens. I'm a 23 year old male in Florida. Fairly introverted and I hardly get out of the house. This encounter happened a few months ago. It was about 12 a.m. and I was getting a bit stir crazy and needed to get out and just chill with someone. So I texted a special lady friend of mine. We made plans to do our normal routine of hanging out at this nice secluded park. I went and picked her up. We drove past our spawn and spent a couple of hours just chatting about anything and everything. Then she got hungry. So we decided to hop in the car and drive down the road a bit to McDonald's. Hooray for 24-7 fast food. This is where things started getting weird though. We arrived at the McDonald's and went inside instead of through the drive through She ordered her food while I went to the restroom to wash my hands. I'm a bit of a neat freak. I really wish I hadn't gone into the restroom that night. As soon as I walked in, I saw this guy standing at one of those heater dryer things. Alright, not too weird. But then I noticed that he was kind of hunched over at it and wasn't moving. Whatever, I chose to ignore him. I washed my hands, but then I realized that he's standing at the only dryer in the place. And the damn paper towels are also empty. So I awkwardly try to ask the guy if he was done using the dryer. He doesn't respond. Thoroughly creeped out, I just walk out and dry my hands on my shirt. I get out of the restroom and find my friend, and we sit down at a table to eat. Maybe 20 minutes go by, and we're headed back out to the car to go back to our spot. Well, my friend has to use the restroom, so I figure I might as well also. I mean, surely that guy had to be gone by now, right? Wrong. That guy is still standing at the dryer, mumbling something to himself now. I go into the stall and take a leak, and I can hear him hitting the button on the dryer over and over again. I wash my hands again and don't even attempt to get at the dryer, but the guy moves just as I'm trying to walk past him. He steps back, right in my path, and just looks at me. I notice he's around my age. He just stares at me and says, Excuse me. Uh, okay. I put my head down and quickly say, pardon me, and rush around him to get out of the restroom. 30 seconds later, as I'm waiting for my friend to get out of the ladies' restroom, the guy walks out. He just sits down at a table near me and just staring straight at me. My friend walks out and notices the creep just eyeballing me. She jokingly asks, Make a new friend in there? I just shake my head at her and try to lean her out to the car without making it obvious that I'm wanting to run from the guy. And then he does the weirdest thing. He just starts cackling like a madman, I mean straight up joker laugh. I'm thinking to myself, oh shit, this crazy druggy dude is going to do something bad. He then just stops suddenly, looks down at my feet, and says, nice shoes, Osiris. Osiris is a brand of shoe, by the way. I manage to stutter. Uh, thanks. And I walk away quickly, out to the car. As my friend and I are getting in, 
we noticed the guy staring at me from inside the McDonald's, just straight eyeballing me, death stare. He then stands up and starts booking it towards us. He wasn't running, but he was like speed walking. He bursts through both doors of the McDonald's and starts coming right at us. Now he looks angry. I pulled out of the parking lot so fast, it's a damn good thing the roads were empty. My friend and I went back to our spot and hung out some more. Every car we saw in the distance, I kept freaking out, expecting it to be that weird guy following us. My friend teased me about it the entire night, and still teases me about it to this day. About how I made friends with the creeper, in the bathroom, who liked my shoes. For some context, I'm a 25-year-old female, and I've been working at my city's hospital for transport for the past couple of years. It can be a chill and sometimes difficult job, but it begins to grow on you over time the longer you work. I work the night shift, so it's not too common for the department I worked for to be packed. I liked working the late shifts as they were mostly slow and much more relaxed. For most nights, you'd have some patients come in for something minor like physical pain or breathing problems. If we got patients who had severe problems like a broken leg or internal bleeding, we'd have to take them to urgent care or the ER. In fact, some can't even make it into the city, so we'd sometimes have the emergency stars helicopter have to drop in once in a while. I've seen some pretty intense things in my whole time working at the hospital. Everything from patients having trouble breathing, all the way to people going into a coma. This one particular night, however, I witnessed something I would never forget. It was a slow night, as usual, and I was talking with my aide about a patient's chart when somebody walked in through the main doors. My aide had left to go check up on a patient, and I was the only one at the front desk. There was a man. He wore a black shirt, a pair of gym shorts, which didn't make sense as this was during the winter and it was freezing cold outside. He looked to be middle-aged, maybe in his mid-thirties, but he looked like crap, almost homeless. Messy, unkept hair, a torn shirt, and smelled like marijuana. His eyes were red and his face was pale, and he looked like he didn't even know what he was doing. The hospital was located in a not-so-great area of my city, so you'd have your occasional creeps come in once in a while. Most of the time, people like this will be high on something and complain about constant dizziness or fibromyalgia from the drugs. He mumbled to me that he had a quote, very bad headache and couldn't control it. I could smell the alcohol in his breath. And as much as I wanted to kick him out, our policy stated that we must care for someone who comes in no matter what. Needless to say, I tell him to sit down in one of the chairs in the waiting area which is right in front of the emergency room. As he turned around to walk toward the waiting area, I noticed something sticking out of his back pocket. And it only took me a few seconds to realize that it was a knife. I didn't want to make it seem like I noticed, and the only security guard that was supposed to be on duty was on his break. The guy then started making strange noises while fidgeting and talking to himself. I had my eyes practically glued to him, and I was just hoping one of my coworkers would come out and call the police as I couldn't page anyone. This guy was big and tall, so there was no way I could fight him off even if I tried. Thankfully, the aide who was working with me had came out and I texted him the whole ordeal. With a shocked look, he steps outside and calls the police and they thankfully arrive within five minutes and arrest the man. The man tried to resist, but it didn't work as he was completely wasted. Now this is the part that still freaks me out. Apparently, an hour before he had came in, he had stabbed somebody in the pelvis working at a gas station. Police had told us that this guy was arrested before for sexual assault and battery. He was charged and was put in jail for 15 years, which in my opinion, got the crime. I still work in the same hospital, and nothing has happened ever since. Last year I was temporarily a host at a restaurant which was not very popular. So we were not often busy. One midday shift, I hadn't seen a customer in a while, 
when this old short stocky man came in and asked for a table near a window. I sat him in the section of my friend Mariah. Each waitress had their own three to four table section of the restaurant to keep the number of customers being seated fair. Mariah was college age and this man was easily around 65 or older. My host stand was close enough to their table to hear the conversation that got weirder by the minute. He kept mentioning that he worked for a towing service. He looked far past retirement age and kept complimenting her. It was seemingly innocent things like, You have a pretty smile. Or, You're a great waitress. To which he kind of nervously laughed about and said something to the effect of, Aw, thank you. Thinking he was just a lonely old man trying to be nice, but then his compliments just got downright strange. With a body like that, you must have a boyfriend. Or, I wish my ex-wife looked like you when we met. At one point she felt him try to grab her ass as she was walking away from him. She got so uncomfortable that she ended up having our male friend Chad finish waiting on the man giving the excuse that her shift was over, when really she went in the kitchen and literally hid from him until he left. When Chad came to be his waiter, the guy lost any cheerfulness in his face and looked genuinely angry. And I was actually afraid at this point, thinking that he might try to prey on me next. I was around the same age as Mariah and the only one in the same area of the restaurant as this guy, but he didn't. He just quickly finished eating while hardly speaking or looking at Chad and left without saying a word. The guy left a tip of five dollars in ones and wrote Mariah on each one, front and back in pen. I assume trying to make sure Chad didn't think it was for him. Our manager gave Mariah permission to avoid this guy any time he came in because of how he behaved. A few days later he came in and asked for Mariah. Her shift didn't start for over an hour, so I told him that I would have to sit him with someone else, and he refused. He insisted on waiting at a table that was meant to be in her section, and literally sat down prepared to wait for over an hour. I went and got our manager and he told the man that he couldn't let him wait for that long in her section, but he could sit him with another waiter. The man then left without saying anything. The main phone line for the restaurant was at the host stand so we could make reservations, etc. And this guy called me the next day asking to talk to Mariah. I could tell by his voice that it was him, so I played stupid and I said, Can I ask who's calling? And he just responded with, No, put her on. I got my manager and he picked up the phone saying, Hi sir, this is the manager. How can I help you? Pause. Uh, she's not here. Can I take a message? I watched his face when he listened to what the guy said next, and he looked like he was about to throw up. He hung up on the man without saying another word. He wouldn't tell me what the guy said. It was clearly something disgusting aimed at Mariah. We ended up having to tell this guy she didn't work there anymore, so he quit asking for her. After he was told that, he never came back. I have no idea what his problem was, but I hope he never goes back there, for Mariah's sake. I was living in a low-income housing apartment in Minnesota, and at the time, my mom and I simply couldn't afford to have an actual internet provider. This meant that I leached off of people in my building who had an unprotected wireless connection. Whenever their internet connections would go out, I would be forced to walk down to McDonald's in order to use the free Wi-Fi there. This had become a pretty common thing for me. During one of these internet droughts, I was standing about in the lobby of my apartment, about to leave, when the guy who lived next door to me, an older guy named Joe, stops me before I go. He tells me that him and another one of my neighbors were going to McDonald's for coffee, and that he'd buy me one if I went along. I figured... Why not? I didn't really know much about Joe since I mostly kept to myself. Let me explain, Joe. He's a hunchback with a beard gut, and his ZZ Top-esque beard was full of food crumbs that I can only assume were from a McBiscuit. But he seemed like a nice enough guy, so I went along. After a ride in his rickety truck through the Minnesota winter, I was happy to reach the McDonald's. Free Wi-Fi at last. 
and if Joe held up to his word, a free McAfee as well. I sit down and fire up the laptop to soak in all of that free Wi-Fi. Soon after, Joe comes back with our McAfee's. As soon as he sits down, he starts asking me in a raspy voice. So, boy, ever heard of God's DNA? I look up from the Windows loading screen and ask, Um, what? I was totally baffled and thinking, great, stuck with another fucking missionary. He goes on to inform me that God's DNA is the molecules that hold the universe together. Not to mention it's what makes men genetically superior to women. I sure as shit didn't learn that in physics class. So I blew him off, and when I got the chance, quietly ducked into another booth to browse the internet in peace. He didn't seem to notice, because afterwards, a barrage of freaky beardy lumberjack dudes would come in and out of the McDonald's and talk to him for like 15 minutes at a time. I can only assume they were talking about God's DNA, because I did my best not to pay any attention. But Joe and his gang of weirdos still gave me a very creeped out feeling. I could tell that they kept looking over to stare at me when they thought I wasn't looking. Having had enough weirdness for the night, I decided to duck out when he hobbled off to the bathroom. I assume only to take an epic mix shit. I took my chance, folded up the laptop, and headed out to brave the cold Minnesota winter on the way back home. I reckon that having to put up with the elements was still preferable to being around a bunch of weird looking lumberjack creeps. I was almost back to the apartment when I heard the truck slowly rolling up and crunching the snow. I looked over my shoulder and saw Joe in his truck. Next to him was another one of those fucking bearded bums from McDonald's. I waved to them but I got no response. Whatever. But then, every night after that, every time I went to McDonald's, either Joe or one of his weirdo lumberjack buddies would be there. I could practically feel them leering at me. They always appeared grungy and disheveled, forced to go to McDonald's just to use the internet. I tried avoiding them as much as I could. It almost seemed as if they knew ahead of time that I was going to be there. Considering they all had a relationship with Joe, I think it's very much likely that they actually did. Eventually, someone broke into Joe's apartment and stole his bicycle, prompting him to move elsewhere. I learned a couple of things about Joe after he left the apartment, such as that he traded most of his food stamps every month for drugs, and that he regularly told women in our apartment that he wanted to leave his body and spirit and ravish them in their sleep, whatever that meant. After this point, though, I saw the McDonald's stalkers only sparingly, and then finally, never again.